Hello, and welcome to Crime Corner. I'm Omnidog from Omnidog's Vault, joined with Taylor Brown, the Minister of Comics. How's it going, Taylor? I'm doing great. I know what all of our viewers are thinking right now. What did I do to be so lucky to have Crime Corner two weeks in a row? Well, <laughs> Jess and I have been burning through some crime books, and we thought we'd just have a special episode tonight. We read three different crime books this past week, one of which is probably one of the most anticipated books of the year for yeah. a lot of people. And I haven't heard a bad word spoken about it. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So I'm excited to review all three of these books. Jess, how are you doing today? So far, so good. Thank you. All right, good. Um, uh, what? Uh, let's see, we're dealing with hot a couple of Aftershock books, Hot Lunch Special, Killer Groove, and the highly anticipated book is Pulp by yeah, so John Phillips. The original plan was to do Pulp and Cruel Summer together, but Cruel Summer just came out this past week, and we don't know when we're exactly going to get it in the mail. I know, Jess, you pre-ordered yours through DCBS, so you don't know when that's going to come out or I not. Don't. So we both read it this week, and we both just happened to read these books as well. Rick, we might as well just do an episode while it's actually fresh in our minds. Yeah. So we'll get to Cruel Summer, though. In a couple of weeks, hopefully, whenever that whenever that arrives at our doorsteps, and hopefully Jess can sneak it in before his wife notices. <laughs> You've been on a good hot streak, though. You got to tell the viewers about your hot streak. <laughs> you got to give away all my secrets. That's true. <laughs> it's okay. I um uh, well, what if my wife watches this one? Oh, that's true. Never mind. <laughs> Daddy, he, I'm just joking. This isn't actually happening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm just, I'm just trying to get him in trouble. Don't listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're more safe on Omni Bros, I think, than on this channel. Well, actually, I can tell you about a statue I got because I'm selling a statue uh, to to uh, compensate for it. I, I got the um, death bombshell, uh, death from Sandman. Uh, I got her bombshell. And one statue that I I, I kind of liked, but I never really loved, was um, uh, the um, Emma Frost, the, the Harley Quinn Mad Love one, where she's in her nighty trying to seduce him. There's a big statue, oh. not a big statue, but it's um, eight in eight inches, ten inches, about like that. So big, um, yeah, too big for Tyler Blunt, is what you're saying. Yo, it's, it's, it's too tall for Tyler Blunt. Yeah, six inches would. It, are you seeing any comments? I'm seeing a couple. Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. I need to. I need to get on YouTube then because having, I'm not. Seeing, for some reason, I'm not seeing any comments. You had a yeah. You had a problem with this on uh, Omni Bros last night, right? Yeah, and I'm still having a problem with it. I think didn't like Lou and some other people on Monday have to exit out, but you can't do that because you're the host. Yeah, so we can't really. I'll make sure to keep an eye on the comments. Well, I okay. Um, we'll do it that way. Yeah, I, I for some reason the Mad Love statue just doesn't uh, just didn't do it for me, and so uh, I'm going to sell that on eBay, and it'll it, for about what I paid for the uh, bombshell. So it's okay. That can be revealed. I'm trying to remember that one because I remember you showing off your Harley Quinn statues a couple months ago when we did that Harley Quinn centric episode. I think I remember seeing that one. She's got it. Yeah, she's she's in her uh, like a red. Um, right. When she says, "You want to rev up your Harley?" That scene. From I that love. Oh so, yeah, she's got a pop gun, and in a in a red um, str uh, string uh, nightgown, not nightgown, but kind of a lingerie thing. That yeah, she's trying to seduce him. I think. When is your Selena Kyle by Joel Jones statue coming in. Uh, that is a good question. I have not gotten a um, a shipping notice on that yet. That's not coming from BBTS. That's coming from Entertainment Earth. Okay. And I didn't. And how are you feeling about the whole DC collectibles line? Did you really buy that many toys from them or statues or is that DC really Direct? Yeah. Yeah, I really did a lot oh, of them. You did. Yeah, they they made um, a lot. Well, I think every statue I've got. If I'm now, I'm, I'm not sure how it worked, but 
every time I went to pre-order a statue that I wanted on DCBS, it fell under their uh, head, uh, head not headline, but the like the button that said DC Direct. And you okay. hit that button, and then there would be like the big bar to bombshell and the cover girl of Zatanna. And if you wanted to pre order them, they were always good prices. And it came under DC Direct. So I'm, and I love their statues. Almost, almost every cover girl statue they did, I found really appealing. And of course, the bombshells I loved. So yeah, I'm, I'm worried about what. Who's gonna? I mean, are they gonna license it out? Are they going to uh, do it in house under a different name? No, I don't think they're gonna do that. I think they. It sounds like they just don't want to do it at all anymore. So I'd assume they're gonna license it out to somebody. But they were a really quality product. I love the Cover Girls line, and I love the Bombshells line. And they had a lot of good, a lot of good action figures too, especially the Batman animated series lines they did. Yeah, they did the original designs from the first three seasons, and they did like all the other new designs from the fourth season, which I I don't have any, but they all look really nice. They always had a quality product. Yeah, it seemed like the ones that you had more of an issue with were the Mattel ones. Is that correct, or is it? Well, the, yeah, and that's something that they license out. So, um, uh, those are the action figures. Yeah. Um, that's why I have so many Marvel action figures because they look and uh, are, have articulation that are so much better than Mattel's. They they were by Hasbro, um, and they there's the sculpt on their face on the Hasbro ones from Marvel are just amazing, and then the sculpts from Mattel for DC were just really disappointing. They didn't look mm. anything like the character, mm. or even remote. Or remotely like a human face. That's that's my biggest issue with a lot of action figures that the face sculpt looks really weird. And yeah. Again, that's why I really like my Hellbat statue because yeah. it doesn't have a, it doesn't really have a face; it has a visor, and so yeah. you don't have to worry about that. But I think you're right that for the most part, the McFarland toys do have better face sculpts than most. I would say. And I have a, there's a couple questions in the chat. Well, first of all, there's Hayden McGee. He might be a potential customer for your Harley Quinn statue. He says, wait a minute, there's a Harley statue in the lingerie scene from Mad Love. So maybe Hayden <laughs> McGee, if you want to buy that? Jess is, trying to, <laughs> Jess is trying to get rid of it. So I am going to sell it, but I'm afraid you live in Scotland, Hayden. That's going to be too expensive to ship to you. Oh, well, maybe he's willing to pay for it. Who knows? <laughs> we also have uh, Joe Goose in the chat, the guy who made you all famous with his... Uh, Oh, with the of you. design, yeah. If you ever did a uh, drawing of all the Omni Dog co-hosts, I wouldn't complain about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we would, uh, what my distinction would be. I think Tyler, Tyler would probably be the easiest to have, like a Dr Pepper in his hand and an action figure. Yeah, and oh, for ETL, it would have to be like a, a nickel the size of a manhole cover. <laughs> yeah, or opening. <laughs> Opening his coin purse and a moth coming out. <laughs> yeah, so Joe Goose, no pressure. But if you ever want to do a pictures of the rest of uh, all the Omni Dog co-hosts, you have some ideas there. Yeah, and there'd be you. Uh, you need well, he's already done Kristen for the Omni Bros Network, so he could just use that. Picture. Oh, that's true. That's yeah. true. That's a good idea, actually. He could just use you two guys if you ever wanted to do that. Isn't that a new? Sh didn't, don't you guys have a shirt or a hoodie like that? Of that I, you can now? order them. Yeah. And somebody, some two people showed him off on, I think last Sunday's show. Uh, they look really good. Is I it was, a hoodie or is it a t-shirt? Is it both? What's that? Is it a hoodie or a t-shirt? Both. Okay, because yeah. now now's not, now's not exactly hoodie weather. But I'd buy a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, and the design will not only is. Um, of course, really a good design. Joe Goose did a great job on it, but um, it came across, it comes across on a t-shirt and a hoodie really nicely. I was really shocked at that. It just, uh, they do a good job at that company, whatever it is we order from. I have an idea. Maybe for me, it would be me have, holding up like a magnifying glass to a book looking for all the flaws in it. Yeah, you're overanalyzing it. <laughs> Going yeah. like this. With a you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my overanalyzing host. 
But yeah, Joe Goose, you're a great artist and you did a great job with that. And oh yeah, you really did. Be cool. Do you get all the t-shirts that you guys produce or do you only get a couple of them? Uh, I have I have one of them, uh, the Omnibus Collectors Network. I don't. I should get that Omnibros big red Omnibros live one because I like the way that looks, and they're not expensive. Um, I like the way this new one looks for sure. I think this new one looks really streamlined and really really cool. Yeah. And Doc Collector has a question for you, Jess. Are you getting the Punisher and his bike? I'm guessing that's a statue or of some sort. Oh, is it? Um, no, I'm not going to get that. I'm I'm sticking to my uh, girls' club only. Yeah, I was going to say you don't really have any guy statues. You have guys action figures, but not statues, right? Right. It turns out I do have one, and I forgot about him. He's a great statue. Um, it's a uh, John Constantine. Don't you have a Darth Vader or something? A Darth Vader statue? Oh, well, I have one where you where you press the the button and he uh, says some lines from the movie and then moves his parts and stuff. That's not really a statue. That's a toy. Oh, so okay. Got it. So you yeah. have one statue and it's, it's unfortunate that, well, Jess and I were talking about this earlier. DC is canceling a lot of titles and unfortunately Hellblazer uh. Constantine by Cy Spurrier is one of, one of them, which is really sad because whenever Cy was on our channel a couple of months ago, he was kind of lamenting all the different titles that were kind of on hold right now for him. And Hellblazer was his big book. So I feel really bad for him personally. I do too, because he's the first one since the original Hellblazer to get John Constantine's voice right. Um, the uh, uh, New 52 and uh, Rebirth, you know, the early Rebirth, any anything except for uh, Justice League Dark. Uh, the Justice League Dark Constantine acted more like the Constantine we're used to. But the other uh, New 52 and the early Rebirth titles and stuff just did not hit the right notes at all. And Hayden McGee says Harley Quinn is ending too. Yeah, I knew that. That's sad. I think that's – I wonder if that's due to, uh, in part to the Harley Quinn Birds of Prey movie not doing well at the box office. Boy, I, you know, I don't know. They – when it was popular, it was because of Palmiotti's and Connor's run. That's when they sold the most Harley Quinn books, I think. And they haven't been on it for a while. Did their run go into Rebirth at all? Or was it a total brand yeah. new team? Yeah, they had a whole omnibus. The first three, I have three hardcovers of them. And they, I don't know, there, there were four trade paperbacks of the new uh the the palmiati and connor um harley quinn that i think sam humphreys wrote and you haven't uh, read that yet so if that, sorry you haven't read that series yet i haven't or? read that yet no i have it but i haven't read that have you had you heard good things about it or no oh, that's unfortunate <laughs> but i'm still gonna read it yeah i'm still surprised harley quinn's one of the most popular characters at dc at this point because there's the there's the animated show which is really popular. Yeah, I, mean, I just feel like in Suicide Squad with Margot Robbie. I mean, I guess the movie Harley Quinn and Birds of Prey didn't do so well, but I still think she's a really popular character. So that's yeah. really surprising. It, that's one of those things where I don't think they marketed it well. Yeah, the the first trailer was just awful. The second trailer was really good, but you may have lost half your audience after that first trailer disaster. I wouldn't even say the second trailer was really good. It just didn't make the movie look bad. It just looked like it was going to be okay. The movie was much better than both of those trailers made it out to be, in right. my opinion. Yeah, and then it had that weird title at first. Now they've yeah. changed it for home viewing. Um, I don't know. I just wasn't... It, they didn't market it well at all. It could have done better because... As you said, it, it was it, we both liked it, and I think it could have it could have done better. May, you know, that, when was it released? February. That can be a tough yeah. time for a movie. It was right before COVID hit too, so I think it probably would have went into March a little bit, but that kind of cut it off a little bit the knees as well. That was the last movie I saw in theaters before this all hit. Same with me. So and Hayden McGee makes the point that a lot of this stuff was supposed to end because of 5G it was supposed to happen this fall. But yeah. I Spurrier definitely talked like he was going to do Hellblazer for a while if they let him. 
Yeah. Some of these tiles weren't supposed to end so prematurely. So I think some of them definitely were planned, but I think a lot of them, I actually read an interview with Jim Lee today on Hollywood Reporter. I'm just saying they kind of have to cut some of the tiles for the bottom line. Him trying to dispel some of the rumors that AT&T doesn't want them to make comics anymore, things like that. So some of these tiles did have to be cut because they weren't really making enough money and selling enough copies. But again, there are some books in his estimation that are doing extremely well like The Three Jokers by Jeff Johns and other books like that. So I, I, some of these books had to be cut, unfortunately. It's sad. I was, <laughs> I texted Tyler Blunt today and said, hmm, you declaring this the summer of DC and DC going in the toilet. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if this is a coincidence or not. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, don't underestimate my power. He's like, if you cross me, punish. He's like, Daredevil and Batman will be next. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to declare this fall, this, the, uh, the fall of Dr. Pepper. And action figures. <laughs> but apparently, there's a Dr. Pepper shortage, which someone pointed out. There is, yeah. Dr. Lecter. So Tyler Blunt's probably hoarding that, like like the toilet paper people were hoarding I on think early he is. In the pandemic. Yeah, he starts out with a couple a day. That's how his morning starts out. I'll I'll never understand how Tyler is so thin for drinking, uh, uh, ingesting as much sugar as he does. I definitely yeah. wouldn't be able to maintain that girlish figure. Yeah, if that was him. Yeah, yeah, he he. I think he goes through like 10 cans a day of Dr. Pepper. Wow. That wouldn't crazy. surprise me. And that would, I mean, you weren't even close to that in the heyday of your pop drinking. Oh no. I did like five Coke zeros. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot, but nowhere near 10. <laughs> I can't no. even, I feel like I'd feel sick at that point. I feel like if I drank more than two, if I drank like more than two pops, I would feel sick. Well, I don't drink them in a row it was spread oh, out okay. through the day, but I I knew that it was a problem that I was second down five a day. <laughs> and the root beers too. Yeah, I wasn't, that was, uh, that was more for the show that I did that. It's not like I, I drank those throughout the day. I, I would do that for, for show effect and to, to, because it was called root beer reviews at first. So I would always have a root beer, but of course back then I was doing like four, videos a week and so i was having all these root beers and root beer floats and everything and so yeah that was not good for me <laughs> i'm the reason why the root beer reviews don't happen anymore you can blame me for that <laughs> oh, oh what did you do i forgot remember i told you to post a certain picture of a book that you poured root beer on and someone got oh. really offended. i don't want to get into all the details of it but <laughs> we, me and jeff always joked that was the one thing i told him to do that was the wrong thing to do everything else i told him to do has been right yeah, that's right. That was one place where your judgment wasn't 100%. But I think I, I'll still do a root beer review, but I just won't dump root beer on a book. Okay. So just for anyone who's wondering out there why Jess doesn't do that anymore, <laughs> it's my fault. Yeah. I've, I've, I've added, hopefully I've added some good things to this channel, but I did take that away, unfortunately. <laughs> that's okay. It's, it's time was up. And Hayden McGee has this to say about Sam Humphrey's Harley Quinn. He said his run is like getting someone to write Batman who doesn't know a thing about Batman. It's so uh, bad it made me drop the book, and I've been with it since the New 52 issue number one. Ah, uh, Now, didn't Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor do like a Black Label Harley book? I think so. It's going to be like a four-issue book. Okay, I think Hayden McGee always talks about that and always promotes that in the chat. So that should be a, I mean, that should be a good book I look forward to. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that collective. I think they they do have a good uh, idea of what she should be like. I still need to collect that Harley Quinn series. I never read it. On the line, um, if if you like the animated special, I would think that you'd like the Palmiotti Connor book. I think it's because there's three omnibus, and it's it's hard to buy them. I mean, I just don't want to buy them all at once. I think if I had, if I had bought them as they come out, yeah, I see. I see. As one month, I just need to like shell out the money for all three of those. Cool. Yeah. Do you want to jump into some of our reviews? Sure. And everybody in the chat, we'll be taking questions throughout the review. So just shoot out your questions. Jess can't see them. So I'll pick and choose the most, yeah. the most appropriate yeah. questions for our chat today. I, so can't, I'll be, I don't know what's going on. I, I can't post to Facebook, and now I've lost the ability to see. Um, uh, and the other thing was it was – I don't know what it is now because last time I was logged on to Omni Bros. This time I'm logged on to my own channel and I can't see. So it's got to be a StreamYard issue. 
because I can't see the comments and I wasn't able to on the Omni Bros either. Yeah, because you so. can see it on the YouTube channel, so it has to be a StreamYard problem. Yeah. And the problem with not being able to see it here is that you can't highlight them, so I have to read them out loud, which isn't a big deal, but it's always nice to see them on the screen. Right. And before we jump into a review, uh, TA has this to say, you guys should do more artist edition book reviews. I don't think Jess or I are really big artist edition buyers. At least I know I'm not. Yeah, I'm not really either. I have a couple, but I don't buy them regularly. I think the person who really is into that is Gabe, if I remember yeah. correctly. So maybe you can uh, try to get in the Omni Bros chat someday and try to convince Gabe to put up some reviews. I know his absolute fourth world review is pretty popular from what I've heard. Um, as far as, yeah, artist editions, I'm not, uh, I've, I've never been into them really. I've got a couple. I did a review on a couple that I have, but I don't, uh, I don't collect them on a regular basis. Sorry. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a big collector of, of art books where you just look at them and there's no story involved. Yeah. I, I don't know why. I mean, I can just look up those images online. That's how I feel at least. I know. With, with a book, you have like an you have like a narrative experience. You're sucked into the story, and the art's a big part of that. But I don't want to really look at just art <laughs> flipping through it. That's just yeah. my personal opinion. Some people really get into it, though, and I understand. I get the attraction, and and I understand it. But I, I it's just never been something that I've uh, wanted to shell out the money for. Right. So sorry, TA. Maybe you can try to get uh, Gabe to post some reviews of that on his channel. Yeah, sorry, TA. Well, which book do you want to jump in first, Jess? Uh, how about Killer Groove? All right, we'll go through the Aftershock books first, then we'll dive into Pulp. Yeah. So these are two books that I heard about, I heard a lot of good things about, and I know you're a big fan of Aftershock comics, so I thought yeah. these are – and the thing about Aftershock is you, they're not going to be on Hoopla. You really can't get them for free anywhere, so I want to support a smaller publisher, though. And I and I really like Ollie Masters. I thought he did a good job on the kitchen. Did you ever read that Vertigo title? Oh, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard the movie wasn't very good, but the comic was really good. Yeah. And so I, I really enjoyed that. Comic. And this is set in the same decade, the 1970s, but instead of New York, this is set in L.A. And so, Jess, do you want to show off some of the art while I read the back? Yeah. All right. In 1970s Los Angeles, Johnny is one of many musicians trying to make it big. He works a crummy bar job getting drunk with his whiskey-soaked P.I. friend Jackie. When Johnny gets tangled up with a local mob hitman, he not only finds a new and violent career, but maybe the inspiration for his music as well. So basically, this guy's like a burned-out musician. He had one really popular record, I believe, and then he kind of fizzled out really quick, kind of like a one-hit wonder. And he, ha he has no muse anymore. He has no inspiration and so, like, as the back of the book said, he meets this mob hitman who's in that panel right there named Iggy, and he actually hires him to carry out hits. And he actually finds out that by killing these people, he's being inspired to write music. And I thought that was the most innovative and cool part of this story, was that killing was his muse, in a way. So, Jess, what did you think of this book? Um, well, I like this book because of the the twist that you said where like killing is his muse and he turned out to be like a natural born killer. Um, he was um, really in these, um, he was in this dive bar playing for no one. Uh, and then it was his job to clean up afterwards. Um, and I, I, I got a, uh, I thought it was really well done how they brought, they had a couple storylines go going uh, at the same time, and one was with the private investigator who's pictured here, and then um, the other was with his uh, killing career, and they, they brought them both together nicely. I thought that uh, it would um, – so that they, they both came together and tied up nicely, and I – and his – I just thought it was interesting that the that the killing was his muse and his his career um, took off his music career took off as soon as he started killing, and I found it um, I I enjoyed this book I thought it was really interesting and fun. Right, and the first two issues I was wondering how these plot threads were going to weave together because there's Johnny the musician there's his female private eye friend Jackie, 
Her uncle comes in from Cuba who has some trouble following him and a little girl whose father goes missing. And so for a while, it seemed like it was kind of running on parallel tracks, but in pure Seinfeldian fashion, all the, all the storylines came together at the end and really dovetailed really well. And I really thought the ending was very, was, it was, it was a satisfying ending, at least for me. Yeah. I thought and, so don't, too. and don't be confused by number one on the front. This is a standalone volume. I think this cover is just the first issue, just put right on the cover of the book. So this is a standalone mini series. So this isn't volume one, just to be clear. Everything wraps up neatly at the very end of this book. And I really like 1970s crime stories. I think crime stories definitely thrive in that setting in that decade. So I really recommend this for anyone who's really into like down and dirty 70s crime stories like Dog Day Afternoon, Taxi Driver, those kinds of movies. It's a really satisfying crime book, in my opinion. And I, I and I'm really, I, I'm really satisfied with the aftershocks, the aftershock books that I've read so far. They have a really good hitting record for me. I think you, you're pretty excited about all the books they put out for the most part. Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think where my aftershock section is, though. I, I do. Uh, wait, is it? Yeah, I have the uh, baby teeth, dark arc, and a walk through the woods, and a book called Dark Red. So far, yeah. they've all been really good, all of them, across the board. And I have the A Walk Through Hell hardcover with the infamous misprint, or the infinite, the infamous duplicated page. Yeah, it, it really didn't mess up my reading experience at all. The page that was missing isn't really important to the story, and Jeff sent it to me anyway, and he posted it on the Facebook group. So I was yeah. able to at least figure out what was going on to some yeah. degree. So I, I'm, I'm not going to send it back or anything. It's not really needed. It didn't really mess up the book for, for me. Did they? Has there been an offer out there for you to send it back? No, I don't know. Maybe maybe they don't know about it. I don't know if anyone's caused a big stink about it or not. It's a little bit different than a book like Gideon Falls Volume Four, where yeah. all the word balloons are out of the final issue. Is that what it is? Uh, yeah. Because that's just you can't read a book like that. That's impossible. You have no idea what's going on. But one, there's one duplicated page, one missing page, and the dialogue in that scene really isn't that important. Yeah, and Chris Kaufman, you were here a couple weeks ago talking about that. He said that's what I said about his copy of Walk Through Hell. So it really isn't that big of a deal. I, I feel like I, I would have noticed, obviously, the duplicated page, but I would have noticed the missing page if no one had said anything about it. Mm, that's good. Oh, okay, Chris Kaufman actually has an update on a Walk Through Hell. My local comic shop called them about it, and they do know about it. I think they, they might do a reprint of it. Oh, okay, good. Because I did hear Mike Marks in an interview with – He's the main publisher at Aftershock, talking, doing an interview with Garth Ennis, saying they grossly mis, <laughs> misprint, not misprinted. They didn't print enough volumes of that book. They didn't realize how many people actually wanted it. So they'll probably reprint it because they want to make more money, and they'll probably fix that issue, hopefully, whenever they do okay. that. Because Garth Ennis is probably their most famous of, of writers that they have, him and Donnie Cates, I would say. Yeah. So all of his series probably make a decent amount of money for them. And I like their hardcover so far. That Baby Teeth hardcover is nice. I like my Walk Through Hell hardcover. They put out a quality product minus the misprint. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've been pretty happy with the books I've had for them so far. So we're going to get into a book that maybe Jess wasn't so happy with. So maybe his first bumpy, uh, his first bump in the road with Aftershock Comics and yeah. that hot lunch special. And at least I don't know if we both can at least agree that it has great art, right? Yeah, I like Jorge, the art a lot. Jorge Fornes is a great artist. Those of you might know him from his run with Chip Zdarsky on Daredevil. He also did a couple issues with Tom King on his Batman run. And he's also the artist of Tom King's upcoming Rorschach series. So he's definitely a big up, up-and-coming uh, artist. And you can definitely see the ghost of David Mazzucchelli walking through this book. Maybe mm. I shouldn't say ghost because David Mazzucchelli is still alive. But you can see his, <laughs> his influence throughout these pages. I just think he is a brilliant – he's not just a good artist. He's a good storyteller. I think yeah. what he does is so clear, and the action is very dynamic. And so I'll read the back for you while Jess can – you can show off some more art. Is blood thicker than sandwiches? The Corys are a classic immigrant success story, a Lebanese family who carved their slice of the American dream by becoming the largest distri distributors – distributors, sorry – of vending machine sandwiches in the upper northern Midwest. Unfortunately, the Corey's gains have been ill-gotten. 
and a branch of the Chicago Irish mob has come back to collect a past debt. Fealty is demanded, shots are fired, and a long-hidden family secret is finally revealed. Now Dorothy Corey, the daughter of the family patriarch, is forced to unite her splintered bloodline and fight back. So I did enjoy this book. It really felt like a season of Fargo to me, which I greatly enjoy that show. I know, Jess, you're not a big fan of that show. No. But I really, <laughs> so that's so that, that, I mean, that, that's probably tied to maybe why you don't like this book as much. I think it's definitely an homage to Fargo in a lot of different ways. I just thought it was a really well-told crime story. It might not be the most original story. Again, it's very much an homage to Fargo. But there were some moments in it that surprised me. And one in particular I don't want to ruin where it really subverts a trope from the Fargo TV show and movie. And I really like how you see the flashback scenes do this family line and how it became so corrupt and how they got to where they are right now. You see flashbacks to their great-grandfather in World War II. You see how their father got involved in the family business and how all the kids kind of got involved or kind of ran away from it and how – this corruption, how this or, this tie to organized crime really affects the grandchildren of this family as well. And so there are a lot of characters in it. There's three cousins that show up that I don't think Jess was the biggest fan of because they all look very similar. <laughs> so, yeah, they weren't important to the storyline, I didn't think, and they just helped confuse things, but go ahead. So I like the story. Again, it wasn't the most original of stories, but I think there was enough surprises and well-done panels and moments that it was a worthwhile read for me. I think you should listen to Taylor on this one and not me because I didn't care for it, but I also didn't care for the Fargo TV show. And halfway through this book, I thought to myself, this is reminding me of Fargo. I like the Fargo movie, um, but I didn't dig the Fargo TV show. Um, That's and, interesting that you didn't like Fargo because it's made by the same guy who made Legion. Noah Hawley. Okay, well, that's the way it goes. <laughs> no, I was just saying it's interesting just because I know you love Legion so much. Yeah, but it was different story matter. So it's true. I don't know. Um, I think Legion's brilliant. So I, I mean, well, I could get into Legion. So we're on the exact opposite of that spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> I think Legion's absolutely brilliant, but uh, I felt like there were way too many characters to keep track of. Um, and when you get that many characters, you don't really get a chance to uh, give one or two of them enough characteristics or enough of the story for you to latch on to them and and uh, and relate to them or sympathize with them whether they're the good guy or the bad guy I, I feel I felt like it could use uh, less characters and more uh, concentration on a couple of characters so that I could have, uh, been more interested in what they what their what they were up to and what their futures held for them, um, but I didn't I I didn't see anything new in this book, and I didn't see anything that really excited me in it. And as I said, there were too many characters. But I also know that this book has gotten um, a lot of praise, and with Taylor praising it, I. I think you should ignore me, pretend I didn't even talk, and just listen to what Taylor has to say, since he enjoyed it and a lot of other people do too. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to say it's a perfect book. It definitely has some flaws and some shortcomings, I think. But I think the art definitely makes up for some of the narrative missteps. I think there are a lot of characters that are introduced that they probably didn't need that many cousins. <laughs> I think they, they maybe would have benefited from another issue to kind of flesh out more of the backstories of these characters. Yeah. Do you think that would have helped a little bit? I think so, yeah. If I could have found found out more about some of the characters uh, for me to care about, yeah. And so that's always a good problem to have, at least, that you wish wanted more not less of what you got. <laughs> well, I guess that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. So it's only five issues. It's not a very long book. I think it probably would have benefited from one more issue to kind of flesh out some of these characters, even though there are flashbacks for most of these characters, but especially the, the, like the characters we just talked about, the uncle and the cousins to kind of see what their skin in the game was, to kind of see what was going on with them, because they do play a crucial part in the story towards the end. Yeah. And you kind of, I think you'd feel more for them if you kind of knew more about them as opposed to them just being three annoying guys who look very similar. <laughs> <laughs> but again, if you like the Fargo TV show like I do, I think you'll greatly enjoy this book. 
I think that's that's probably, I think that's right. And someone comments, it sounds like that book could have used a good editor. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And I read in the introduction, the, the writer of this, Elliot Rahal, is Lebanese, and he kind of put some of his own experiences as a Lebanese man into this book. And not that his family owns a sandwich company and is tied to organized crime, but it sounds like he has some family issues and some family secrets in his past that he was kind of able to expel some of those demons of his past through this book. Mm. So it's a very personal book for him. Oh, great. I don't like a very personal book for somebody's <laughs> life work. Well, I think every book is personal to every writer. So I wouldn't That's feel too bad about it. And you're not saying it's a horrible book that you're going to put your on. So. No, 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 not at all. And it's okay if we disagree on books. And at least, yeah. at least this one isn't as vehement as Matador. <laughs> I'll never live that one down. I think our two biggest disagreements at this point are Matador and Doomsday Clock. Uh, let's see. I didn't care for Doomsday Clock, right? Yeah. And you did. Yeah. Right. I joked around with Jess that I'm the more critical one, but recently you've been the one who's disliked more books than I have. So we've kind of switched roles at this point. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe I'm rubbing off on you with the critical eye. Yeah, I'm look, I'm analyzing books and looking at them a lot harder now. And you're you're rubbing off on me, and me just want to have fun and enjoy everything. <laughs> We're switching choices at this point. Right. All right. So, do you want to jump into the most popular book of all the ones? Yeah, right number right? one on IST. And this is a book. I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm just going to jump ahead and say everyone needs to buy this book. I mean, look at the two names at the top of this book. If you haven't bought it already, what are you doing? Yeah. Just go, just go ahead and buy it because the thing with Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips is that with these hardcovers, they do like one printing and that's it. And they'll probably come out with an inevitable paperback like they did with My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies. So I would definitely get this book right now if you can. It's not expensive. It's only $17 cover price. I think I got it for, what, $10? on yeah. ISP. It's really cheap. And it's very worth it. Do you want to show off some of the art while I read the back, yeah. Jess? What did what do you do when you expected to die young but somehow didn't? Max Winter used to have a different name and a different life a long time ago. Now in 1930s New York, Max survives by writing thinly disguised tales of the man he used to be for the pulp magazines, tales of the forgotten frontier, and a wild outlaw dispensing justice with a six gun. But as his life begins to crumble and he watches the world move to the brink of war, with Nazis marching across Europe and the streets of New York City, Max finds himself thinking like an outlaw again. And once he starts down that path, there may be no going back. So this story, like, like I already read off the back, is wrapped around a former outlaw who kind of uses his stories from his past to sell pulp westerns. And he kind of works in his knowledge of you know robbing stagecoaches, getting in gunfights, things like that. He gets paid, I think, two cents a word <laughs> for what he writes, or maybe I think it actually gets knocked back to a penny a word. So he's in dire yeah. straits financially, and he has a wife he needs to take care of, and he turns out he has a heart condition that's debilitating him. So he wants to find a way to take care of his wife before he passes on. And I think very similar to Bad Weekend, I think Ed Brubaker really touches upon the idea that a lot of creative people really get screwed over by their publishers. <laughs> so it's kind of like a... A, uh, I wouldn't say a satire, but a comment on the publishing, the, on the publishing world, whether in comics or in novel form. So I think that's an interesting trend that he's kind of followed with with Bad Weekend and this book. So Jess, what do you think about this book? Uh, well, I love this book. Um, I'm happy to read it again uh, in a little bit because it it's not really long, and so you kind of blaze through it. Um, I thought that was fantastic that he was in New York in 1939 and, and writing stories of himself as like a stagecoach robbing bandit back in 1890s, the 1890s West. Um, and he, it was just so, I thought that was such a great uh, idea that you got, um, you got the, you got a flavor of both. You got like a little bit of the old west with his being a gunfighter back then and and now he's older and writing stories about it in new york um as the nazis are starting their march across europe and which does play into the book um i 
the thing this book kept it down this is what i liked about it in comparison to hot lunch it kept it down to a super manageable amount of characters. There's just like two or three characters that you care about, uh, especially uh, the, the main character. Um, and th so you really care about him and you really care what happens to him and what he ends up doing uh, in the book to uh, sort of, he has feelings of, um, not impotence. Um, helplessness, I would say. Yeah, yeah, helplessness. And he does uh, feeling, he has those feelings and he does stuff uh, towards the end uh, to make himself feel better about that, um, to, to make a difference again. And I thought it was extremely well done. And uh, the art, of course, is great and fantastic. And then um, Sean Phillips' son uh, did the coloring, Jacob. Ooh we interviewed several months ago right I, I really loved how each how he did a really different coloring job on the past right was, i really like the color palette that he chose for both eras because it, it differentiates them really nicely sometimes when you read books and it goes back and forth between timelines you're not exactly sure what's going on or what part of the you know you read the past or the present Good or the point. future it was always really clear cut what was going on and when these things were happening because of the color choices which is a really great um, I think it was a really great idea for all of them involved. I think Jacob Phillips is a great colorist. I'm really excited to read his new book coming out, that, that Texas Blood, I believe it's called. And so I think that got delayed a little bit with COVID, but I think two issues are out now, and th there should be a trade paperback out by the end of the year. So I'm really excited about that. Do you remember the writer on that? I don't remember the writer's name, but I know Jacob Phillips is attached, and his art is fantastic from what I've seen. He looks a lot like his dad's art. They both yeah. have very similar styles. So I'm really, I've heard nothing but good things about it. Okay, good. And someone asked us a question. I think we've answered this already, but we'll answer it again. Is Pulp or Cruel Summer included in Criminal Deluxe Volume 3? It is not. Pulp is not even set in the criminal world. It's a total side story that's not tied into that world at all. And Cruel Summer is an oversized hardcover that will not be included in Deluxe Volume 3. So but definitely get both of these. It is stories from the criminal era uh that is confusing i can see why people are confused about oh yeah a special especially i think a lot of people would be less confused if they were able to subscribe to the ed brubaker newsletter like i am he <laughs> clarifies these things a lot i mean you really shouldn't be a new newsletter to not be confused about these things but unfortunately the way they do put things out can be a little bit confusing so if that's you and you feel like you're not exactly 100% sure on what they're always put, putting out, subscribe to that newsletter. He answers fan questions. He puts forth books and movies that he's been consuming that you should also check out as well. And he kind of gives you a glimpse of what's coming up in the future. So definitely get Pulp. Definitely get Cruel Summer because they're not coming out in that third hardcover coming out this fall. But if you get the third deluxe of Criminal and Cruel Summer, you'll get the whole story. Right. Right. The uh, Cruel Summer is actually going to be a pretty thick book. It's it's uh, Criminal One and Criminal Five through Twelve. It it's going to be a big book. Yeah, I think it's around three hundred pages, something mm -hmm. like that. A little, a little over that, maybe. So whenever that arrives on my doorstep, that's a day one read for me. <laughs> I'm ripping it out of the cellophane. I'm going anti Jess where things are on the cellophane on the shelf for years. <laughs> Was that last night when you pulled the cellophane off a book during the you show? <laughs> I wonder how many books you pulled the cellophane off of on live shows. It must be like dozens at this point. Uh, that may be, yeah. I still have plenty still in the cellophane. <laughs> this is a, I know this 2020 really sucks, but it's been a good year for Brubaker and Phillips at least because they have Pulp, they have that third deluxe of Criminal, they have, they have Cruel Summer, and at the end of this year, we're getting an original graphic novel, Reckless, the first in the series by them. So even though 2020 sucks in a lot of different ways, at least we're getting some really quality crime books from the best dynamic duo in comics. Yeah. It's not even my opinion, it's just fact. Yeah, no, <laughs> nobody can argue with that. So I wanna talk a little bit about how this ranks in terms of the novelas they've done, and to kind of give you an idea of their novelas, it's Pulp, my heroes have always been junkies and bad weekend. So Jess, what would you say is your top favorite of those three? Of the novellas? Yes. 
Um, you, you give your top, you give your rankings and I'll do mine. I would say it goes junkies, pulp, bad weekend. And mine would be pulp heroes have always been junkies and bad weekend. And all three of them are fantastic. I'm not trying to cast shade on bad weekend, but I think that these two books definitely do well because they were originally designed to be graphic novels. Whereas Bad Weekend was two issues of a comic book that they kind of expanded to make into a graphic novel. And even mm. though I think it's great and it's fantastic, I think these books are designed to be in this format. Yeah. And I think Pulp is just really different than anything else they've done before. And so I feel like yeah. they're really stretching their creative muscles. And it was just a it was a flawless story in my opinion. This would be a fantastic movie. It's only 72 pages long. You wouldn't really have to cut anything. I just think that this would be a fantastic movie that – I, don't, I, I just think I have nothing to complain about with this book. I can't think of one bad thing about it. No, I, I can't either. I junkies. I have sort of a sentimental attachment to um, just because of how they treat the subject matter uh, in it. Um, and so that I think that it was sort of more personal for me, which is why I have it ranked above pulp, but pulp is fantastic. I absolutely can see exactly why it's your number one. And I think Junkies and Pulp are really close. I think just Pulp just edges it out a little bit more for me because it's so different than anything else they've done before. I think that's what put it over the top for me. I really like the Western setting and the 1930s crime noir type setting. And I really love that one character who came in back into Max's life, the Pinkerton, who used yeah. to like chase him, and they actually partnered together to pull a heist. And that was just a really cool dynamic. I think the Pinkerton was my favorite character in this book. He, yeah, that the the book got really uh, exciting and interesting when he showed up. Yeah, I think that that was because I mean the book is definitely falls in the lines of the tropes of the genre, but I think it kind of was subverted with that with that relationship between Max and the guy who used to chase him and actually shot one of his best friends and killed him. That's right. <laughs> so I thought that was a really fantastic way to add some tension to the story. Yeah, I agree. It was 100% great. One day we should probably do a crime corner ranking all of the Brew Baker and Phillips books. That could okay. Be that sounds good. If anyone's interested in that, let us know. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, I'm just looking at my Brew Baker section. That's going to be hard for some of them, though, because I like all of them so much. Yeah. Well, you still need to read Sleeper, though. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Is that the only Brubaker Phillips book you haven't read? I think so, yeah. We should definitely do a crime corner on that sooner rather than later. Okay. I'm happy to reread Fade Out and Fatal. The only thing I feel bad about with Sleeper with reviewing it is that's so hard to get <laughs> at this point. I always feel bad reviewing books that I own that other people can't really get easily. Yeah. The Sleeper Omnibus is out of print, if I remember correctly. For and a while now. DC put out one of those DC Wildstorm classics. And I had the first volume, and they canceled the second volume. So I had to—I actually found um, season two of Sleeper at my local comic book store. So I was able to buy that. But they don't really look good on the shelf together because they're totally different spines. But whatever. Oh, man. As long as they have it completed, I don't really care. But there's hopefully people can track it down because it's worth the buy for sure. Yeah. So Zach says, I 100% want to see that. All right, Zach, it's done. We'll do it eventually. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to redo, uh, uh, do a reread of all those books. How about we do it by the end of the year? Because that way we can read Reckless, their newest book that will come out. It'll also give us time to read Cruel Summer. So we'll do it maybe in January, in December or January. Okay, that sounds fine. We'll see how that goes. So I want to give my movie recommendations for the books we just read. Okay. So for Pulp, I'm, I was trying to think of my favorite Western movie. And this movie, this book really reminded me of my favorite Western, and that is Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood. That movie just turns the Western genre on its head, and it uses it, it, the most famous Western figure in cinema. Yes, I think Clint Eastwood's a better Western figure than John Wayne. That's just that's just me. <laughs> in my uh, fact, I mean, come on, he did A Fistful of Dollars, Good, Bad, and the Ugly, Outlaw Josie Wales, High Plains Drifter. I mean. Come on. I just think he's much more dynamic, especially as an actor. John Wayne doesn't really do it for me as an actor, in my opinion. I don't know how you feel about John Wayne because he's more from your childhood than mine. But. Yeah. Well, I 
I think you'd have to get people even 20 years older than I am. Yeah, he 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 was a movie icon when I was growing up. <clears throat> But I didn't really remember seeing that many of his pictures growing up. It wasn't until the the VCR was invented and I could get him on VHS tape, you know, uh, movies like Stagecoach and stuff that I started really watching westerns. So I I doubt there's anybody watching this now who's going to argue that <laughs> John is a better uh, uh, actor than Clint Eastwood. And even when you watch True Grit, I think Jeff Bridges does a much better job playing Rooster Cogburn than than John Wayne. I think there's no there's no contest. I, yeah, I, I, think so too. I love that new True Grit. Have you ever seen that movie? I have. I love it. That's a fantastic. I know Jeff Bridges is probably one of your favorite actors. I'm guessing because he plays the dude. <laughs> the dude, yeah, just based on the dude, yeah. So I think Unforgiven just really subverts the genre, and it doesn't do anything that you expect it to do. The main character isn't really doing anything for anyone's good. He's doing it for himself and that he's a brutal killer. And even the sheriff of the town is a total dirtbag. <laughs> he's not a good guy. I think he, Clint Eastwood has really looked at all the things he did in his career in the Western and did the exact opposite. And there's a reason why it won Best Picture. Yeah. What, what would you say is your favorite Western, Jess? Mine's Unforgiven. Do you have a personal favorite? Shane. Okay. You must have liked that part of Logan then. <laughs> yeah that movie really tied into logan a lot even like the storyline at the end too yeah it kind of ties back in yeah were you the little boy at the end of shane <laughs> shane shane come back shane <laughs> uh, i just really dug shane i always dug shane even oh. when i started seeing it as a little kid and seeing it as a grown-up i i i just like all the parts in it sam cluckson is disagreeing with me jess he likes john wayne he said John Wayne can't, I mean, Eastwood can't top John Wayne as Rooster Cogburn. Okay. But Jesse Say What agrees with me saying Taylor's dropping facts. So <laughs> that's how it is. Sorry, Sam Cluckson. I'm glad you're here, but I, I disagree. And Joe Goose really likes Tombstone. And that's a good Western. Oh, yeah, that is a good Western. I really like the new 310 to Yuma with Russell Crowe and Christian Bale. That was a great movie. I haven't seen that. You definitely, that's a really, that's, one, that's probably the best like modern Western in years. Hmm. I'm trying to think of other ones that I really like. Can you think about any other ones that you liked as a kid? <clears throat> uh, you put me on the spot now. Um, I, I I I can't think of any w westerns just in general right now. Um, I, uh, Were you a fan of the Good, the Bad, the Ugly oh, trilogy? High Noon. I loved High Noon. Okay. Were you a big Bonanza fan as a kid? As a kid, yeah. My dad used to always try to sneak Wild Wild West as a kid because his parents thought it was too violent. <laughs> so he always tried to Wild Wild West was fun. The movie is not good, but not right. <laughs> from what I've heard, the TV show is good. It was fun, yeah. I don't think it was any great acting, but it was it was exciting for television at that point. Right. The way it was produced and put together and everything. Yeah, it was fun. Um yeah, high a uh, high noon I think is one of my all time favorites. Um, that's such a good movie. And I've never seen. I feel shame saying this. I've never seen Once Upon a Time in the West. I know that's a classic. Yeah, that is a classic. I've also never seen his gangster version of that, Once Upon a Time in America, both by Sergio Leone. I don't think I've seen that either. They're both like three hours long, so I had to carve out some serious time to watch yeah. that. Do you ever see Bone Tomahawk, Jess? Someone just commented about that in the chat. That's the most violent movie I've ever seen in my entire life. Bone Tomahawk? No, it's I don't even um, know I've heard of oh, it. What's his name? Kurt Russell plays the oh. main sheriff, and they're fighting against these Native Americans who were like really disturbing. Like They actually chop a guy in half. That. They, they had grab him by his legs, like chop him in half. And really? They, like, I don't think out, I need to see that then. They, like cut out this guy's like liver or something and put it in his mouth or something. It's really violent. It's probably the, my brother-in-law and I were laughing about it the other day. I said, "Yeah, just just watch it and see. Tell me what you think." He just said, "I can't believe what I just watched." We were just laughing. About it. <laughs> it, was so, it was so disgusting. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, Zach talked about Blazing Saddles. That's a great movie. That was a classically great movie. God, I love that movie. So funny. Now we're moving away from westerns. Jess, what's your favorite Mel Brooks movie? Ooh, uh, let's see. Uh, Blazing Saddles is up there. There was Silent Movie, which I thought was really clever. 
Young Frankenstein, which was awesome. Uh, I can admit it's not his best, but the one I watched the most as a kid was Spaceballs. I love that movie. Yeah, I agree. It wasn't his best. I think that it's it's made up of a bunch of classic, now classic bits in it. Um, but for some reason at the time that it came out, it just didn't seem as funny. Um, but but looking back, there's lots of scenes that are classically funny now. Oh, yeah. Um, you went over my helmet? No, no, <laughs> not, not over. More to the side. I, I, love, I love that movie because we used to, back in the day, we used to go to the video store and rent it all the time. <laughs> we used to watch it a lot. We love Star Wars, so that was like it's a you know it's a parody of Star Wars. I wasn't yeah. a fan of Robin Hood Men in Tights. I thought that was definitely not his best at all. No, I I, I think Young Frankenstein is probably my favorite. Young Frankenstein is great. I have great memories of that movie, uh, but I think I'll stick with Blazing Saddles. Okay, that is a good movie. Wait, what was the one? <laughs> You'll know immediately. What was the one that Mel Brooks? made a musical and Larry David, he hired Larry oh, David. Oh, the producers. The producers? Yeah, that's a that's a great one because he hired Larry because he thought he'd be so bad that they would finally stop doing the producers and he could just be done with it. But yeah. turns out Larry actually did a really good job. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a great, <laughs> that I was a great it. Curb Your Enthusiasm. And Jeff, I know I've been trying to convince you to get back into Curb Your Enthusiasm. Season 10 had the best story arc of all the seasons where uh, Larry has this guy that he really dislikes and his Mocha Joe. He opens up a coffee. Oh, yeah. Store. You remember Mocha Joe from, I think it was season seven. And he so told they, me about this. He opens up his own coffee shop. He calls it a spite store. It's right, yeah. next, it's right next to Mocha Joe's. It's called Latte Larry's. It's a spite <laughs> store just to spite him. He has all the exact opposite things. And he has, a, he has an anti-defecation bathroom where no one can poop. They just have urinals and he creates like this like patented thing for the ladies that they can't go that they can that they can go number one, but they can't go number two. It was just <laughs> it was just the funniest thing ever. My wife even said that season 10 was by far her favorite, and she loves it. Oh, everything. okay. So I think that's a show that gets better and better every season. So you definitely yeah. jump back into that whenever you get a chance. Yeah. I love that Mel Brooks appearance. And Sam Cluxon wants to know what you think about The Searchers with Natalie Wood. Well, it has Natalie Wood in it, so I had a childhood up until now crush on her. Um, I, I liked it. I, I liked it, but I think it may have been over my head as a kid when I saw it. Now, Jess, do you, what do you think really happened on that boat that night with Natalie Wood? With Christopher so Walken there. Christopher Walken was there too, wasn't he? I know, a young Christopher Walken. Hmm. Wonder what happened that night. I don't isn't, know. Isn't that one of the biggest like Hollywood controversies? Yeah. A lot of people was her husband blamed for killing her? Is that what happened? Or nobody knows what really happened? Nobody got blamed for it. Everybody suspected stuff, but no there were no everybody stuck to their story that she slipped off the boat. But her husband was there, right? Oh yeah, Robert Wagner was there. Okay. You know, they're making a West Side Story remake right now by Steven Spielberg. And I will not be watching that. <laughs> what if you hear it's fantastic? I will uh, say <clears throat> I'm glad people are happy. I am not watching it. Okay. There is no way I am watching. There's no earth in any universe that needs a remake of West Side Story. What's your opinion on remakes in general in terms of movies? Uh, I guess it depends on the remake. Sometimes the remake's better than the movie, but I, you'd have to you'd have to tell me what the remake is and what the movie is. If it's a classic, I mean, if they're going to remake Sound of Music or something, then that's stupid. And same with West Side Story. I think the reason they want to remake it is because of racial sensitivity to the Puerto Ricans back at that time, they felt it was super stereotyped, and uh, and I'm afraid they're going to take away any of the charm or any of the interesting tension that went on between them. And and hey, I am a diehard believer in um, uh, it, it, like what you like, love whom you love. Uh, Whatever whatever your issue is, as long as you don't hurt anybody, 
I am a live and let live guy. Um, and I'm sure that that movie had some faults. I don't know what they were because it's my favorite movie of all time, but it's a product of its time and just leave it alone. If you don't like it, don't watch it. I just want them to start making more original movies. Like I remember that hearing like, you know, rumors of a back to the future reboot. I would never watch that in a million years. No. How could you ever do better than that movie? No. I think, I think back to the future two is pretty good. I don't, I don't like um, the third one very much, but that first no. one is an absolute top 10 classic. I agree. My favorite movies of all time. Yeah. I can't imagine redoing that any better. Yeah. There's was, some movies, like you said, that maybe they weren't as good, but they had good concepts and a good base, but it wasn't executed well. Those are the movies that should be redone and remade. Not one yeah. of the absolute classics, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I now it gripes my cookies that they want to redo it and make things more sensitive uh, culturally and everything. And and I am. I am a left-leaning liberal. I am. I will come out on the air and say it. I totally believe Black Lives Matter. I totally believe everything. But when you it comes to West Side Story, you should not touch it. It is a product of its time, and it needs to be left alone. Well, I just think that we can't just totally like just ignore all the great movies and books that came before because they don't have. The, the language and the political correctness that we have now, that's a product of its time. Right. It's important not to forget those things. Right. Like I'm, I'm reading a crime novel right now from the 80s, and it's the way they talk about people of color, it's like, ooh, that wasn't... But I know <laughs> that I know the author didn't mean it offensively. That yeah. was just the way they talked back then. I'm not trying to justify that, but just I, right. know that the, I know that I've seen this author interviewed and heard him, you know, I know he's not like a racist person, but it was just the way they said things back then, and we would never say that now. Yeah. Hopefully, as we get progress, we can learn some more and learn what we shouldn't say. But just totally ignoring the past, it just doesn't really gel with me personally. Because if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. So, yeah. And in 50 years from now, my grandkids will be like, I can't believe this movie came out in theaters in 2020. Well, no movies came out this year. 2021. <laughs> you know what I mean, though? Yeah. In 50 years yeah. from now, there'll be things that they read now that we put out, things that we watch. I can't believe they did that. That's how it always happens. And I don't want Steven Spielberg to be the arbiter of cultural sensitivity. I, you know, <laughs> I'd rather see him come up with some cool science fictiony stuff than a new movie than than uh, remake uh, stuff from the past. And Hayden McGee dropped in very serious, very serious question: Has anyone heard from Tyler Blunt lately? I want to know how his new elephant is doing. <laughs> Stampy. Stampy. <laughs> Sam Cluxon said, are you telling me Natalie Wood wasn't Puerto Rican? Question mark. The, what, the what? He said, are you telling me Natalie Wood wasn't Puerto Rican? <laughs> 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 All right. So for Paul, getting, getting off the tangent, we just went down for 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Unforgiven was my choice for Pulp. And my movie recommendation for Killer Groove is my favorite one of my favorite movies last year. My other favorite movie was Avengers Endgame. My other favorite movie was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, God, that's, what a great movie. That's one of my favorite Quentin Tarantino movies. And that's saying something. I like almost everything he's done. That's also, I think that's set in the 60s, though, not the 70s, but it still had that same vibe to it. Right. And I really love its take on how the Manson murders played out. I don't want to ruin it for anybody who didn't watch it. But it's kind of similar to the Glorious Bastards, where Quentin Tarantino has some fun with history and kind yeah. of rewrites history and <laughs> in ways we wish we almost wish Tar Tarantino had been there to write yeah. that story instead of what actually happened. Right. That, I think that's probably one of my top three favorite Quentin Tarantino movies. I think for me, number one's always me Pulp Fiction. I don't yeah. think you can beat Pulp Fiction. Then it's Django Unchained for me. I just love that movie. And then Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So I love that movie. If you haven't seen yeah. it, you really need to watch it. I love that movie. And then for Hot Lunch Special, obviously Fargo is the big inspiration for that. But we, all, I think most people have seen Fargo at this point. And I, I know most people probably know about the TV show. Go and watch it unless your name is Jess Bragg. Hopefully you'll <laughs> like it. And But to, for a movie that maybe you don't know about very much that's set in the Midwest during the winter months is The Lookout. It's written and directed by one of my favorite screenwriters, Scott Frank, and it stars Joseph Gordon-Levitt as a young man who 
in high school was a front runner in hockey. He probably would have played in the, in the NHL, but he got in a really bad car accident with all of his friends where a bunch of people died and got injured. He has a really bad injury. He has this big scar that goes from his head all the way to his back, and he has some memory issues, and he can't really function the way that he used to. And he works in the bank, and he is uh, tried to be taken advantage of by a guy he went to high school with who wants him to help them rob that bank. And it's oh. a great movie. And Jeff Daniels stars as his blind roommate. And it's a great crime movie that a lot of people don't really talk about enough. I haven't even heard of it. That sounds awesome. You would love it. It's a really good movie. I love Scott Frank. He wrote Get Shorty, Out of Sight. Yeah. He wrote Minority Report. Oh. He wrote and directed A Walk Among the Tombstones, which is a Matt Scudder book. We both are fans of Matt Scudder, especially that 8 Million Ways to Die comic book. Yeah. So I think you'd really like The Lookout, Jess. That's a okay. really good movie. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, were you a fan of Hateful Eight, Jess? Did you watch that? I didn't. And I, I don't know that I'm going to. I didn't. I don't. It just didn't sound the plot. The plot and the premise didn't sound good to me. It probably was one of my least favorite Tarantino movies, but it was still a great movie in my opinion. Mm, okay. and Tarantino is still good movies in my opinion. Yeah, I think the only Tarantino movie I don't like is his part of Grindhouse, Death Proof. Oh, I love that part. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't really a fan. I, don't, I wasn't really a big fan of Grindhouse in general. I like oh, the I concept. Was. Um, I like Planet, I like Planet Terror better than Death Proof. It was so ridiculous and over the top. <laughs> Planet um, Terror was funny. I wouldn't say Death Proof was a bad movie. It was just so long and plotting for no reason. It was just I feel like I, I don't mind long movies like um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is long, Django is long, Glorious Bastards is long, but I never felt bored. And I, I feel like I was a little bit bored during Death Proof. And even Quentin Tarantino says Death Proof is his, is his least favorite movie that he's done. Oh, okay. And the sad thing is there's only one more Quentin Tarantino movie left. He's only going to direct one more, he said. He wants to have 10 and then just be done. Yeah. I guess he's written some movies, though. He wrote a great movie, True Romance, which he didn't direct. Right. He also had a, he also wrote some of Crimson Tide, which is also a great movie. Did you ever see that movie back in the day? No. With Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman on the submarine. Oh, I remember that now. That's a really good movie. Huh, Okay. D.H. McAdams, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood made me want to get a flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say about what he's talking about, but that's one of the best parts of the movie. Yeah. All right, so for my uh, music recommendation, I am picking Lee Morgan, who's a trumpeteer. He has a, His most famous album is called Sidewinder. I listened to that as I read all of these books, as well as a crime book I was reading earlier today. Definitely check out that album if you're a big jazz fan. Okay. Anything, anything you listened to recently that you want to share? Uh, I really haven't listened to anything recently except for the soundtrack to Banjo Kazooie. So <laughs> yeah, I didn't listen to it while uh, reading these books. I listened to it while I was cleaning up and inventorying in here. So uh, I didn't listen to anything while reading that was memorable. What if uh, Brubaker recommended listening to Banjo Kazooie while you read Pulp? Very <laughs> <laughs> music. And so Joe Chip asked, "Didn't Tarantino write Natural Born Killers? He wrote the first draft, and it was taken away from him, and a lot was changed." He said he hates that movie, and he feels embarrassed that his name's even associated with it. Oh, really? I never saw that movie. I didn't um, either. It looked way too over the top for me, and just hateful for no reason. Yeah, mean spirited. I would say it's very mean spirited. Yeah, Jackie Brown is another great Quentin Tarantino movie. Brown. That's a fantastic movie based on Elmore Leonard book. But yeah, Natural Born Killers didn't look like the movie for me. No, me either. Were you a fan of Deadwood? People are talking about Deadwood in the chat. Um, I never saw it. It appealed to me to watch, but I just never had a chance to get into it. Some of those early HBO shows, I know how high regarded they are. I just couldn't really get into them. I couldn't get into The Sopranos. I know me that either. I know that's that, blasphemy. That but I is blasphemy, it. I know. And then I saw the ending. It was like, I'm not watching eight, seven seasons of television for that ending. <laughs> I saw the ending, too. <laughs> I mean, maybe, I'm, I'm not trying to speak against the creator and his artistic vision, but when you spend that many hours watching a TV show, I want a better ending than that. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's about it, Jess. Anything okay. else you want to talk about? Good. Um, 
let's see. Uh, we will be back on a week from Saturday. <clears throat> a week from tomorrow is going to be Batter Days in the Bat Cave, where we talk about our favorite Batman memories and wait, best Batman memories and what is it? Moments. So Moment. essentially, this, this will be about. You know, we all have memories, I think, especially associated with Batman. You know, maybe for Jess, it might be watching the '66 TV show back in the day. For me, it might be animated series. Just memories that we really, are, we really hold on to, of like moments where we really loved Batman. That love was really instilled within us. And then our favorite moments from comics, video games, movies, anything Batman related. And hopefully, we'll have a guest star that day, Tlar Blunt, with his elephant Stampy. <laughs> and Tyler Blunt should be giving us a report on his summer of DC reading. We're yeah. his teachers. He's the student giving us his book report on the summer of DC. Unfortunately, we will not know for sure until he actually appears on the show whether or not he's going to make it. Yeah, I've so. never dealt with a, a guy who is so hard to get make a commitment other than Tyler Blunt. Well, Jess, how do you describe oh, yeah. on the show? Use your metaphor for how hard it is to get Tyler on the show. It's akin to it's, it's like trying to nail catch up to the wall. <laughs> Getting him to commit. So hopefully, yeah, a week from tomorrow, you will see all of us, including Tyler Blunt, talking about our favorite Batman moments and memories. And Jess, you actually have a question from N uh, N Man 40 we can end on. Okay. Jess, were you into video games before your daughter was born? Or did she and did she get them? Did she get you into video games? Oh, that's a good question. No, I I was way into video games before uh, Kelly was born. I remember getting the original NES for Christmas back in eighty six. Yeah, I think I got the NES back in Christmas of eighty six, and I poured countless quarters into Donkey Kong in the arcade. Um, I had the Magnavox Odyssey, which did one thing, and that was play Pong. And we thought it was amazing. It cost $100, which was a lot back in 1971 or whenever it came out. Now it's like five to $600 for a system. <laughs> yeah, but all this thing did, did was play Pong. It just came with dials for you to play Pong. Were you a big Pong fan? Back then I was, sure. Yeah. Um, that was the last game my dad played. <laughs> Pong <laughs> the last video game my dad ever played was Pong. <laughs> my dad doesn't understand video games and how they work at all. Oh, yeah. I used to love uh, all – I've loved all the Zelda games. Um, I've, I've had uh, – <clears throat> I had the N64. I had the PlayStation 2, the PlayStation – PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 4. I had the GameCube. I skipped the um, Nintendo um, side scroller Wii? that everybody loved. I can't think of what it was called. Super Nintendo. Um, and I got the GameCube, and now I have this. Now I have the Switch. I got the first Xbox. I got Xbox 360, Xbox One, mm -hmm. and PlayStation 4, and the Switch. My history of gaming is Sega Genesis was my first system, then N64, and then I didn't get a GameCube, even though I played a lot at my friend's house, then PS2, Xbox, Xbox 360, and now PS4. Oh, and I will say my best memories are of games were on the Dreamcast. I love the Dreamcast. <laughs> that was my least favorite system by far. Oh, there were so many games. I hated there. that controller. It was so big. It had that big clear thing in the middle where you could put the cartridge in. Yeah, that was weird. Uh, what was that really popular game? It was like a Japanese game. Oh, I can't remember what it was called. It was like the most. It was like an RPG of sorts. Oh, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, oh, the, Crazy Taxi. That was a fun game on that. I do remember. Oh yeah, that. I remember playing Crazy Taxi. But yeah, I think I think that was probably my least favorite of all the systems. I love the games on the Dreamcast. So for fun. Me, for me, N64 will always be the best system. I just yeah. I got that when I was seven years old. Me, Goldeneye, um, Super Smash Brothers, Diddy Kong Racing, yeah. and uh, I just can't beat those games in my Did opinion. you play Banjo Kazooie? That was one of the games I didn't play very much. Oh, okay. Um but yeah, I didn't really play that. I think my favorite memories of video games of all time is back when I used to stay up to like 
five in the morning with my friends in middle school playing Halo. And we'd always, you ever play Halo, Jess? Yeah. We used to play the level called Blood Gulch, and we'd set it to we're all invisible and only have rocket launchers. And it was so <laughs> much fun. You would just see the the warthog just shooting in the in the air, and a rocket just blasting it out of the sky. <laughs> I've, like, I've never had more fun in my life than playing with my friends back in my. Oh, life. that's great. That was, that's all we would do: just play Blood Gulch, invisible rockets. That was always the settings that we did. <laughs> that's hilarious. Is Shenmue? Is that the Dreamcast game I'm talking about? Yeah, Shenmue. I played Shenmue okay. 1 and 2. I think that was – is that the game you want to play now, Shenmue 3? Yeah, and it's been sitting up uh, in storage ever since I got um, Animal Crossing for the Switch that I've been playing with my daughter. Can Animal Crossing even be beat, or is it just a game you can play forever? I You can play it forever, but my daughter has referred to it as once you beat the game, then you can do this. And I'm like, oh, okay, so it sounds like there is – an ending to it, but you can continue to decorate and build on your island. And when are we getting a glimpse of this comic book store that your daughter made? Uh, she wants it to be perfect, and she doesn't have everything over there yet. Okay. She, she needs me to um, cre uh, create some stuff in the, in the customization part of it. You learn how to customize things. Uh, the one she had on her island was so perfect, but it hasn't translated over to my island that well. Okay. But a lot of components are really good. You need to see it during the day because at nighttime, it's you can't see it very well. Um, but it is really cool. It's And she's designing me a record store now, too. And Jess, for the past couple of weeks, has been waking up too late on Sunday to sell his turnips. So he's been uh, buy my turnips. What time do you just sell them by or buy them by? You have to buy them by noon. She's Trudy or whatever, Trini, whatever her name is. Uh, she's there from like 6 a.m. to noon. And the previous Sunday, I didn't feel well. Last Sunday, for some reason, I slept till 12.05 and <laughs> jumped into Omni Bros. Like, ugh. And I just, so I'm setting my alarm. I don't care how late I stay up Saturday. I'm setting my alarm to wake me up. So whenever you finish doing Animal Crossing, Shenmue's next on the list? I'd, yeah, I'd like to play it again. It's for the PS4. Oh, and you got to play Spider-Man. I know. That, that was such a good that. game. You might want to play Spider-Man because that wouldn't take that long. Shenmue sounds like it'd be a big chore. Not a chore, but isn't that like a longer game? Yeah, and there's a lot of interactive stuff that you're doing in it. Spider-Man. Everybody in the game asking him questions. If you're ignoring some of the side stuff, you can finish that game pretty quick. I know you're not a big side quest kind of guy. This is so, Spider-Man? Yeah. So I think you could bust out that game pretty quick compared to Shenmue. Or, because uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 took me a while to beat. Um, that's a big game. But yeah. I know I knew Daughter wasn't a fan, but that's one of my favorite games in a while. That was fantastic. What are you going to get next, PS5 or the new Xbox? Um, I'm not one. I know that Gio and Lou are people that buy video game consoles like day one. I'm not like that because as with comic books, I have such a big backlog of yeah. games that I usually wait until I'm done, just flat out done with all the old games. Probably be PS6 by the time I get done with all my games. <laughs> I never buy the um, a new console the year it comes out because they don't have enough games to really entice me, and it's so expensive. If yeah. you wait a year later, it's like a hundred dollars cheaper, and there's a lot more games out that you can buy. That's yeah. what I've done for pretty much every system because yeah. in the fall we get Cyberpunk 2077, which I really want to play. So that'll be like a game like that'll preoccupy me for a while, and so then I can buy PS5 next year sometime. That, that's, that, that's how I do it. I don't want to spend that much money right away for games that you really can't play that many of. No, I agree with that. So we tried to sign out 15 minutes ago, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Why not now, then? All right. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Taylor, for being my co-host. Thank you, everybody, for watching and for commenting. Uh, I appreciate it. Feel free to uh, uh, please leave a like. Please um Subscribe and leave a comment. We always uh, respond to comments. So thank you, Taylor, and peace and love, peace and love. See you guys.